When it comes to supercars, this one is everybody's benchmark, Ferrari's 458. Since launch, it's occupied a different league of excitement, occasion and desirability from most of its competitors, whether in coupe or spider convertible form. And of course, it's from a brand with a heritage second to none. That said, for a company with such a rich tradition, Ferrari isn't big on nostalgia for the sake of it. Blending effectiveness with emotion is what this car is all about. Quite frankly, nobody does it better. Think of a Ferrari engine and you tend to think of a screaming V12, forgetting perhaps that most of Maranello's output over the years has been V8 powered. In racing as well as in production terms, it was after all a V8 that took John Surtees to the 1964 Formula One World Championship. And it was V8 power that fired the growth of Enzo's business in the early 70s with cars like the Dino GT4 and perhaps most notably the 308 GTB of 1975. This design sired a whole heritage of mid-engined V8 supercars that continues to the present day with this one, the 458 Italia. If you know the brand, then you'll know many of the V8 models that have brought us to this point. The evolutionary 328 of the 80s, the rather unloved 348 of the 90s, and its replacement, which arrived just before the millennium, the utterly delightful F355. Modern times have brought us the sleek F360 Moderna, which was made until 2005 when it was replaced by the less pretty but undoubtedly more purposeful uh, F430. All desirable, but still seen by many as merely stepping stones to more serious V12 Ferraris further up the range. The uh, Berlinetta Boxer of the 70s, the Testarossa of the 80s, and the 599 GTB of the modern day. All that changed with the launch of this 458 in 2009. It was as quick as any of the exalted V12 models and as pricey once most owners had spec theirs up, especially in the open top spider body style that arrived in uh, mid 2011. It was at last the heart of the Ferrari range, not just the most popular model, but arguably the definitive expression of Maranello magic. Just the thing for the Italian brand to use against the usual upstarts down the road at Lamborghini, and a vital weapon in the more important battle against the clinical excellence of McLaren. Arguably, this is the greatest, the most complete, perhaps even the most desirable Ferrari ever made. But is it? Let's find out. Welcome to the definitive Ferrari experience. So what's it like? Well, you turn the key and then thumb this big red button on the steering wheel. Now you expect the big flare of revs that you get in a Lamborghini Gallardo or even a Mercedes SLS. What you get instead is simply a clearing of the throat as the big 4.5 litre V8 settles down into a crisp idle. But of course what you're listening to is merely a prelude to the main event. Just a couple of flexes of your right foot is enough to deliver a roar. Loud enough for your neighbours to be reporting you to the environmental health. Enough also to remind you that the throttle has reflexes sharp enough to rival Ali at his punchiest. At first it's a slight disappointment to find the classic chromed Ferrari manual gear shift gate missing. This car isn't even offered with a manual gearbox option and very few future Maranello models will be. So what we have instead is a uh, dual clutch uh, semi-automatic affair that uh, uh, is one of those really clever systems able to select the next gear before you've even left the last one. Click it into the first of its seven speeds and roll away and the first thing you notice is that the steering is pretty much as hypersensitive as the accelerator as the throttle pedal. 
Now, with just two turns locked to lock, this car has a really pointy front end. And normally, that'd make it feel really nervous. But uh, somehow, that's not true of this 458. Yes, it still feels like it's drinking Red Bull rather than 98 Ron, but uh, the suspension's so well planted that this car can get away with that fast rack. And uh, another advantage of that really quick steering is that most corners require little more than just a flick of the wrists, keeping you in touch with the uh, gear change paddles and all the steering wheel controls. And of course, that'd never work if you were constantly applying great armfuls of lock. This Getrag twin clutch seven speed semi-automatic F1 gearbox is something very special. Throw a few gears at it and it just keeps pace with virtually no interruption in the flow of power. Gear changes themselves take just 50 milliseconds and the accompanying soundtrack is straight from supercar central casting. Okay, so there's the nagging doubt that uh, the sound has been heavily massaged to come across like this, but who cares? It'll have you searching maps for the nearest tunnel and making a thorough nuisance of yourself. Uh, only the central exhaust outlet is open at half throttle, but uh, push your right foot down a little harder and the outer two uh, outlets also spring to life. Like most modern Ferraris, you can change the car's dynamics via this little rotary controller on the uh, steering wheel. It's called the Manatino. And uh, via this, you can alter the electronics that govern the chassis, the engine, and the transmission by tweaking the traction control, the stability control, the settings of the electronic diff, and even the ABS brakes. There's a choice of uh, wet, sport, race, or uh, CT off settings. CT off means traction control disabled. Then for the brave, the foolhardy, or the merely very skillful, there's the ultimate, you're on your own, uh, ESC off, which uh, sees you with the traction control and the stability control disabled. Whereas before, in models like the old F430, the suspension would revert to a firm damping setting if the driver wanted a fast gear change. Uh, here, it's possible to select the most aggressive engine configuration with uh, a setting that's compliant enough for a really bumpy road. You just uh, press the button on the steering wheel with this damper graphic and the suspension will revert to its softest setting while keeping your really sharp gear changes. The 4.5 litre direct injection engine is of course something very special, developing an eye-watering 570 PS. So you might expect it to be rather highly strung, but in fact it'll lug from uh, around 1500 RPM without any problem at all. Around 80% of the torque is developed from just 3,250 RPM, reassuring the driver that the remaining 5,750 RPM to the 9,000 RPM red line offers plenty of space to play. The steering wheel rim can be specified like this one here, with built-in shift lights at the top of the rim to advise you when you're approaching the red line. It all adds to the drama when you're going really quickly, as if any more were required. But is it properly quick? Well, of course you knew it would be. Rest to 60 takes just 3.4 seconds and you'll flash past 100 miles an hour in around seven seconds. Nought to 124 miles an hour uh, occupies only 10.4 seconds and the maximum speed is 202 miles an hour. But those are just stats and little prepare you for the reality of just how exciting that will all feel. So many cars today are hugely capable, but reduce the whole business of going fast to something that's totally anodyne. And the genius of the 458 is that it's completely the opposite. It always feels alive and you don't need to be going around corners all bent out of shape for it to offer a real experience. Get it onto a track, loosen off the shackles of the electronic control systems a bit, and you'll have a real hoot. But just be aware of your own limitations. The uh, unforgiving tyres, the square footprint, the mid-engine configuration, and the lightning quick steering mean that if you do bring the back end into play, you'll need to be very handy indeed if you're not to end up facing the wrong way. Like the old F430, this uh, 458 has a launch control system. The twin clutch gearbox can handle full bore starts a bit better than the old F1 transmission, but it still feels incredibly violent. 
On a circuit, you'll appreciate the huge carbon ceramic brakes as they offer fade-free reassurance long after a set of conventional steel discs would have had your brake pedal disappearing into the carpet. On the road, if I'm honest, I think they're a bit over-specified for the task, but uh, they enable you to modulate the braking very effectively when you're um, charging into a corner. It's certainly a lot better than the, uh, the discs that you get on a Gallardo. For all Lamborghini's specialisation with carbon, they've never quite managed to get brakes right. Those in this 458 will hang you from your belts in a punchy stop and they never feel squirrely when you're breaking down into a corner. In fact, the way that all the electronic systems in this car talk to each other is really good. Porsche used to be held up as a master of this kind of dynamic behaviour, but I think Ferrari are now matching them. The ride, as I've said, is adjustable, but even in its most accommodating bumpy road setting, it's firmish, though hardly what you call choppy. Road and wind noise are also well contained, but this isn't a car for bumbling about in. It wants to be pushed, and when it is, uh, it's enormously reassuring in the amount of grip you get from the front end. The steering feel contributes to this, and Ferrari reckons that they've been able to achieve it by small but significant changes in the rear multi-link suspension, mainly to the camber angles and the wheel centre movement that have enabled them to increase roll stiffness and fit this faster, more precise steering rack. It certainly never feels like it's going to flop into roll oversteer, and the centre of gravity also feels agreeably low, something that hasn't always been the case with classic mid-engine Ferraris. This 458 Italia has been developed from fundamentally correct first principles. In other words, believe the hype. Now, I know styling is a largely subjective business, but just look at this 458. If you think this car is anything but stunning, then it might be time to get yourself to the opticians. Nods to the past, are tail lights from the Enzo, air intakes from the 308, mix with a fashionably low waistline and the kind of deep windscreen you'd get on a modern endurance racer. Where Ferrari has been extremely clever is in mixing uh, sharp creases like those here in the chamfered front wings with sleek compound curves at the same time as building in solid aerodynamics to the exterior design. It's actually the sleekest Ferrari ever thanks to lovely details like these aerolastic winglets that bend at speed to direct air underneath the car or engine bay cooling vents that use uh, air in the wheel arches to uh, increase cooling and further aid downforce levels that at top speed equate to nearly a third of the weight of this 458. The science of directing air around the aluminium crafted bodywork is clearly taken very seriously at Maranello. The rear haunches are a lot cleaner than those of the old F430 because there are no bulging inlets. Instead, engine cooling is taken care of by these vents either side of and below the engine glass house. Now, they might not look very big to deal with a power plant this size, but uh, after talking to Ferrari's aerodynamicists, and they went into great detail about uh, boundary layers and laminar flows that I must admit went a bit over my head, uh, I'm reassured that it all works. And uh, just in case you're not convinced, then there are further vents to cool not only the engine, but also the clutch and the gearbox, either side of the rear lights here, and also flanking this triple barreled exhaust. Let's have a look at a few more details. The carbon ceramic brakes, for example, they measure a huge 398 millimeters at the front and 360 millimeters here at the rear, with six piston calipers at the front and four pot items here at the rear. Now, if you take your 458 on track and leave it in race mode, then you're going to get through rear pads quite quickly as the stability system does quite a lot of work here at the back. So you'll either have to factor in the cost of replacements or turn all the stability systems off when you go on track, which might be even more costly. Your call. The long headlights are a real 458 signature design feature with a main lens that's a rotating by Xenon light that uh, offers low and high beam functions that follow the car's movements through curves in the road. 
Now above this lens, you've got a stack of 20 high intensity LEDs that form the daytime running lights, able to increase or decrease their brightness depending on the ambient light intensity. And inside the cabin, well, there's plenty of headroom, uh, whether you opt for this 458 Italia or the Spider convertible version. And once inside, as you'd expect, it's very driver orientated with the main emphasis being on this central rev counter bordered by these two configurable TFT color screens. The one on the left can help you monitor various temperatures and pressures and show you the exact level of electronic assistance the various driver aids, the diff or the gearbox are providing. It also rather helpfully gives you a small speedo digital readout at the bottom which is fortunate because uh, the large speedo readout, which is one of the functions of the right-hand screen, will more usually be masked because you'll be wanting the screen to show you in-car entertainment information or, or sat-nav displays. It's all rather a lot to take in, especially as the designers have taken the rather unusual decision to mount all of the main controls directly onto the steering wheel. Yes, just like a Formula One car. But Formula One drivers don't have to worry about things like lights and wipers. Now it's a rather fiddly way to operate them and you often find yourself uh, switching on the wipers when you're trying to flash the headlamps. Also, the same with the directional indicators. They can be very awkward to use during wheel twirling, say when you're coming through a roundabout. And for the same reason, the wheel rim mounted horn buttons can be difficult too. But you get used to it all over time. Now a guy called Frank Stevenson was the man most responsible for signing off this Formula One steering wheel design, but he was then poached by McLaren to try and whip the MP412C into shape. And that car emerged uh, from the design studio with a steering wheel featuring precisely no extraneous controls on it. Figure that one out. What I can't fault are the controls that you'll find behind the steering wheel, these lovely tactile gear shift paddles. Now I must admit, I do rather miss the lovely old chromed open gate manual gear change uh, arrangement that older Ferraris used to have. But that was a dog to use. And these paddles do give a very clean look to the cabin. Now, rather unsurprisingly, you don't get a huge amount of stowage space. Though the 230 litres that you do get here in this car's nose is more than is on offer from any of this model's rivals. A McLaren MP412C, for example, gives you 144 litres. Uh, a Lamborghini Gallardo, just 110 litres. While even a Mercedes SLS can only manage 173 litres. You probably managed to get a couple of squashy bags in here and maybe something like a laptop case behind the front seats. If you want to do better and you can afford it, then Ferrari offer a couple of very expensive tailored luggage sets that fit both the area in the nose here and the rear bench. But either way, if you're looking at using this car for a weekend jaunt, then you'll need to pack lightly. Should you choose the 458 Spider, of course you'll have to do without this coupe model's lovely glazed in engine cover. But compensation comes in the form of a folding aluminium hardtop that's not only aesthetically cohesive, but also does its thing in just 14 seconds and features just two moving parts that slot neatly into a gap between the engine and the seats. Lopping a car's roof off is usually a first class way to ruin it. Not this time. You knew, of course, that Ferrari 458 ownership would hardly be inexpensive. And if you're realistic, you'll also know that the starting price will probably only be a beginning point through which you progress uh, through some well-chosen options to a final invoice cost that'll probably be up around the 200,000 pound mark, almost the exact amount necessary to buy into the open top spider version of this car. Time to put those figures into some kind of perspective. In this sector, as in Formula One motor racing, uh, Ferrari's two most direct rivals are arguably McLaren and Mercedes. If you're looking for a, a 458 Italia, then opting for something similarly powerful from both these marks, uh, say a McLaren MP412C or a Mercedes SLS AMG, would save you in each case about 10,000 pounds, and both cars have their attractions. 
but neither has this Maranello model's legendary heritage, of course. If you're attracted by the extra traction of four-wheel drive, then Lamborghini's Gallardo LP560-4 at a, a £16,000 saving might be tempting. And if you're into Bond 007 style dynamics, then a similar outlay to that required for this 458 would put you in an Aston Martin DBS. And of course, I should point out that you don't actually have to spend anywhere between 180 and 200,000 pounds to go this fast in a supercar. Uh, you could say between 50 and 70,000 pounds by opting for, say, an Audi R8 V10 or a Porsche 911 Turbo S. Few, though, will see this 458 as representing poor value for money. It's the best car in its class, and that carries an inevitable and justifiable price premium. You'll happily sign the order for this 458, then spend hours pleasurably trawling through the eye-wateringly expensive features on the options list. Let's take this particular car as an example, typical of what most owners want, with around £26,000 worth of extra cost features. And if that seems a bit extreme, then let me show you how it all adds up. Let's start with the things that the sky-high asking price really should include as standard. A car this expensive really has no business rolling out of the factory gates without things like satellite navigation, an extra £2,200. Um, rear parking sensors, an extra £1,500, or even an iPod socket, oh, an extra £600. Next come the things that you really ought to have on a car this pricey. And amongst these I'd include the um, satellite uh, anti-theft system, well worth having for an extra thousand uh, pounds. The anti-stone uh, chip uh, protective film that protects the paintwork, that's an extra two thousand pounds. And uh, a rear parking camera to compensate for the truly awful rearward visibility, that's an extra two thousand two hundred pounds. From then on, it's just a case of including the things that you'd want to make the ownership experience really special. Like these Scuderia shields on the fenders, an extra thousand pounds. Or these lovely painted 20 inch alloys, an extra 3,600 pounds. With their Giallo Modena um, yellow painted brake calipers, they're an extra 900 pounds. Also nice to have, are these beautiful carbon fibre trimmed door kick plates, uh, an extra thousand pounds. Although I could probably do without tyre pressure monitoring for an extra thousand pounds, I'd be hard pressed to resist the uh, steering wheel rim LED lights that uh, light up at high revs for a cool three thousand pounds extra. Nice too to have these leather trimmed carbon fibre fabricated racing seats at £5,000 extra with personalised seat piping uh, around £600 extra and seat stitching around £300 extra. Now to this little lot the only uh, two things I would have been further tempted to add would have been the premium hi-fi system for around £3,500 more and the personalised luggage set for the rear bench and for the boot at a cool £7,000 extra. Such is the cost of exclusivity. It's tempting to think that things like emissions and economy are largely irrelevant if you've got £200,000 to throw at a supercar. Not so. Now that virtually every car in this class will top 200 miles an hour and get uh, from rest to 60 in just over three seconds, manufacturers are looking for other ways to establish bragging rights in this segment. Hence, uh, Ferrari's provision of an H-E-L-E -E system. That's uh, high emotion, low emission. Uh, it's essentially a start-stop setup that cuts the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck in urban traffic or when you're halting at the lights. In an age when the cheaper Super Mini very often includes this as a standard, it's a bit disappointing to find that Marinello will charge you an extra £900 for it. But for those owners that do tick the box, there are marginal improvements in both fuel economy and emissions. 
The standard 458 Italia manages 20.6 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and puts out 275 grams per kilometre of CO2, while the Spider convertible version manages uh, 23.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 307 grams per kilometre of CO2. Now, if you think that that sounds like a recipe for some pretty high running costs, then spare a thought for the poor Italians, who are currently being crippled by a huge super bolo monitoring tax that imposes a tax fine of 20 euros a year per kilowatt of power that any driver's car generates over a tax-free limit of 185 kilowatts. So this 458 Italia, it develops a total of 419 kilowatts. That's 234 kilowatts over the limit. 234 times 20 euros equals a fine of 4,680 euros, uh, about 3,760 pounds. And that's on top of the normal Bolo motoring tax that Italy levies on all its drivers of around 1,300 euros a year. Ouch makes you feel a bit easier about owning one of these in Britain, doesn't it? And you'll feel even better about ownership prospects when you factor in class-leadingly low depreciation. That's assuming that you haven't gone wild on the options list. If you have, then don't expect to get your outlay back when it comes to trade-in time. Nor should owners stand for lectures from the green lobby about eco-friendliness. After all, this car uh, is hand-built rather than being having been manufactured in a smog-laden factory. It'll never be scrapped and it'll probably be driven for very low mileages throughout its life. All of which makes a supercar like this probably one of the most eco-friendly automobiles you can buy. That'd be my justification for owning one anyway. As for reliability, well there's no reason why it shouldn't be faultless. If you've heard scare stories about 458 Italias bursting into flames, well that really is very old news. The uh, earliest models featured wheel arches that uh, featured a kind of industrial glue, which when it got really hot dripped onto the engine and caused fires. But Ferrari quickly fixed that problem by riveting the wheel arches and since then there hasn't been any reoccurrence at all. Insurance is a stratospheric group 50, so it may be wise to get a range of quotes from specialist brokers. Uh, but you do get a four-year unlimited mileage warranty and seven years of uh, scheduled maintenance covered by the Ferrari Genuine Maintenance Program that covers all of your garage visits in terms of maintenance anyway for that period and is included within the price of the car. Make no mistake though, this 458 will prove to be a very expensive machine to run. I mean, tyres alone are 400 quid each and you'll also get through brake pads reasonably quickly if you drive the car hard. Still, at least the carbon ceramic brakes that other supercar makers like Porsche charge a fortune for are included within the price of this model. Rumour has it that when McLaren was developing its MP412C supercar, uh, the engineers had a couple of Ferrari F430s in as benchmark comparison models. The British design team stripped these down, rebuilt them and made sure that their car would be able to knock Ferrari's finest into the middle of next week. There was only one problem. They used the wrong benchmark. Nobody, you see, at Woking, nobody in the supercar industry was quite prepared for what a massive step forward uh, the F430's replacement, this car, the 458 Italia, would prove to be. Apparently, it all went a little quiet at McLaren the first time they got a car in for appraisal. The supercar game, they discovered, was tougher than it at first seemed. The 458 has proved to be one of those rare, right first time designs. You see, what Ferrari understands, and what some of its rivals have yet to grasp, is that in building a supercar, 90% of the challenge is in getting the intangibles right. The styling detail, the tactile feel, the, the sound, heck, even the smell. With this car, all of those details are exactly as they should be, which is why this model has so established itself as a benchmark in the supercar sector. 
It's as charismatic and exciting as every Ferrari should be, but better built, higher tech, and more beautifully appointed than any of Marinello's V8 supercars from the past. Now these were essentially stepping stones to the model that you really wanted, but this one's a journey's end in itself if a classic Ferrari is all you've ever wanted. More extreme models have certainly rolled from the modern factory gates, but few have been faster than this one, and none have been more easy to drive or more daily usable. It's this blending of practicality with such pure operatic drama that makes the 458 what it is. Drive this, and in comparison, a McLaren MP4 feels like a domestic appliance, a Porsche 911 hopelessly outgunned, and a Lamborghini Gallardo positively ancient. In truth, nothing else really comes close, because in truth, nothing else is ever really quite like a Ferrari.